the relationship between capital and wage labour is an internal one. Exploiter and exploiter are bound together in this intimate relationship of interdependence. Interdependence, that's critical. In other words, the worker uh, depends upon the capitalist, because the worker only owns his or her labour power, the worker has to go and work for a capitalist and be exploited and all that sort of thing. But there's another side to that. The capitalist depends on the worker. The worker's labour is the source of the capitalist profits. When the worker's labour stops, then capitalism stops. And this isn't just an abstract proposition. Because again, let's go back to the case of China, the so-called future of capitalism. What we've seen in recent weeks are explosions of strikes by this new working class <laughs> bringing to a halt processes of production, extracting massive pay, pay increases, shifting the whole relation of power between capital and wage labour. And that's the bottom line of, about, co about communism. And actually it's an idea that pre-exists Marx that goes back to Blanqui and the radical French communists that what the force that is going to achieve communism is precisely that mass of wage labourers who are expressed, who are oppressed and exploited by <coughs> capitalism, but precisely because they're exploited, have the capacity to carry through this revolution that can take us out of capitalism to communism. <coughs> It's so nice that we can immediately uh, enter into a dialogue because strangely that you, first let me make a bad taste remark when you said you were down there in South Africa and then you started bursting to cry, uh, 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 crying, I thought because England is to Germany, okay, but that's it. I also did share our opposition to cheap patriotism. When Slovenia lost to England, my son was almost beaten by his peers because he was for England. So we are all here, but let me go to the more serious work. Uh, 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 yes, I share deeply your wonderful idea is looking at ourselves from the future museum of capitalism. But the first bad news we have today, I was in a couple of them, is that, you know, unfortunately, museums of communism already exist in practically all post-socialist Eastern European countries. I visited one in Budapest, for example, when I bought a wonderful thing, a candle as a figure of Stalin, and then you light a candle as a candle. Okay, let's go on. Where I also, what I also share with you is uh, at least the first part of your critique of Badiou, that is to say his total conscious, you cannot accuse him that he didn't see it, he is absolutely consciously opposed to it, of the very notion that critique of political economy has a place, a direct place, in what he calls idea of communism. My point here would have been simply that one should, what one should do with regard to but you is, because but you is here, although he denies it, obviously Kantian. He even calls in his communist hypothesis the idea of communism a kind of Kantian regulative idea. And he absolutely opposes any too narrow mediation between this idea and uh, actual social life. For him, this is already historicism. You fall into the historicist trap. What I think is that we should pass here from Kant to Hegel. Hegel for Hegel, idea is something which is not just an ideal opposed to reality, but something which has in itself the power of its own actualization, which may sound ultra-idealist, but it's exactly what Marx says in what you refer to him, that, that is to say, to conceive the idea of communism as a real movement. Maybe our small differences begin with where to locate this real movements. Uh, let me begin with some quite empirical remarks. You know, I was in China when this happened, three, four weeks ago when these strikes started, and maybe this is a manipulation, what I was told, 
them. But I wasn't told by official representatives. I was told by this, maybe you know them, one Quay and other critical intellectuals. They told me that these strikes were strictly tolerated even up to a point, how do you call it, incited by the Communist Party, as part, they think that the only way to cut a long story short for China to retain its economic momentum in a situation of worldwide crisis is to insist the purchase power of the local working class. So for them, they're maybe a little bit too cynical. They say, of course, this discontent with strikes was all the time there. The mystery for them is why all of a sudden were strikes not only tolerated, but even positive, that was for them the big sign, positively reported in the media. You know, till now, if you mention the word independent trade unions, before you finished the sentence, to put it in bad taste, ironic way, you already had a one-way ticket train to Mongolia, to some camp. All of a sudden, now, my gold strikes get positive mention in the official media. But my modest counterexample to you would have been precisely China. What my friends then are trying to convince me is that exploited as they are, and I totally agree with you, this Fox Sport story is ridiculous. The nicest part of the story is this one. It was reported, I hope you know it probably better than me in the media. You know how Foxconn reacted? It's ridiculous. It's the best of the brutal cynicism of what we call patriarchal caring charity, human relations, capitalism. You know how Foxconn reacted to this wave of suicides? Three things. First, all people who work for Foxconn had to sign anti-suicidal pact. <laughs> so thank so, promising that they will not kill themselves. Second, this is not a joke, that's so crazy about it. Second point, now this we got more into Orwellian ominous waters. They had also to sign a legal obligation that if they see their fellow worker like depressed in a suicidal mood, that they will denounce him to the factory authority. Oh. So that they can call a psychiatrist. And the last measure, it's not a joke. Because as you said, these are gigantic factories, they don't give enough space. Most of the work happens in high rise buildings, which is why the suicides are mostly done by jumping through windows. This is not a joke. They are putting large nets, nets work. <laughs> I am the first one to agree with you. But what nonetheless they told me is that, and this is the tragedy of the situation, that in spite of all of this, those who can move to these big industrial cities like Shanghai and others, consider themselves up to a point, even the lucky ones. The true problem is background. And there, there we have a totally different situation of these half-unemployed farmers, and maybe this is at least as important a movement. This is why I think maybe we should show a little bit more mercy towards China. Maybe I was told that these poor farmers who are left behind by this capitalist eclosion are starting to organize themselves, and organize themselves in Chinese numbers. A kind of a self-created network, we are talking about tens, according to some, uh, uh, sources even 100 to 100 of millions of people. Autonomous farmer self-organization and the Communist Party, not for any good democratic reason, but because they think that if they oppress this, there is an even stronger exp explosion at a certain point, is seriously considering the possibility of allowing them, of recognizing them at least as some kind of a partner. Maybe this is just an old fascist formula, corporate organization, maybe it's something more. But when I maybe don't quite agree, now I come to basically, first, I think uh, you were a little bit unfair, although I criticized him all the time, I'm ready to take the blame for the commons, the work Tony Negri, because he would concede all this, you know, exploitation, new subjectivity, exploited by capital, what I am claiming is something, and I will try to put it as brutally and openly as possible so that I expose myself to the counterattack. What I am claiming is that to grasp, I repeat what I, the claim I made here the last year, that to grasp today, today's capitalist dynamics, this logic of exploitation is no longer enough. That again, to grasp the capitalist dynamic, you need to
to take into account first the new role, important role, as a source of wealth of raw materials, which for Marx were basically out of the equation. You know, the irony is that when Marx checked it up in Capital, wants to demonstrate that raw materials cannot be a source of wealth in the sense of value, of course. He, you know what he gives as an example? Oil. So, to provoke you, I already was interrupted a year ago, I like to repeat the provocation. I think something very simple. If you apply dogmatically Marx to today's Venezuela, you cannot but say that Chavez is exploiting the United States. He is not. But that's why we have to rethink it. One thing are raw materials, which are an important part of the struggle to build from them. Another one is so-called intellectual property. And that, for me, the problem of commons is crucial. Again, my vulgar example, which I used a year ago. How did that creep, who is now happily on the way down, uh, Bill Gates, how did he become, at least at some point, the, the wealthiest man in the world? I don't believe in the classical Marxist explanation of, you know, extreme, extra, extra, super profit exploitation, I think we should return to the category of rent, which is still some kind of exploitation, but different. Yeah. I think uh, Bill Gates is not so rich because he especially has exploited his workers or whatever, but because, again, he appropriated part of what should be and in a way even is our commons. Each of us, when we want to be in touch in a shared public space, you have to pay to him the price, just so that we can share the same field through internet, social space, and so on and so on. This is for me the logic of the privatization of the commons. It has something to do... Uh, okay. <laughs> I will overcome this quick heart attack and go on. Yes. It has something, I think, to do with the big problem of what Marx called general intellect. Where I think Marx is at his best, you remember in Grundrisse, where Marx says how, uh, uh, how uh, the moment the knowledge, collective practical knowledge, will become the main source of wealth, capitalism will dissolve. He comes very close to some kind of almost economic determinism. I think what Marx didn't take into account is the possibility of this general knowledge, collective practical knowledge, productive knowledge being reprivatized again. This is why I think that although I agree with you, commons were enclosed all the time. I nonetheless agree with those who claim that today we have a new, much more radical, maybe even uh, unthinkable for Marx twist in this story. So this was the introduction, now the shorter part, the main part. What I, okay, I will just enumerate points for you, since I am again, as I always emphasize, the victim of a brutal, metaphysical, linear notion of time. Sorry, <laughs> no, the museum of communism, I'm still absolutely for communism, but what this means is that we, the left, really have to take into account the amount of the failure of 1990. What I claim is that not only did a certain Stalinist state socialism disintegrate, now with a 20 years delay, we are getting that also welfare state social democracy lost is slowly disappearing. And I would add to provoke you something which probably you will not agree, but it's my crucial point, that, you know, all those who were criticizing these twin brothers of two versions of state socialism, Western democratic welfare state and uh, Stalinist, uh, usually do it from a position of a dream of councils, Soviets, immediate democracy, and so on and so on. I claim that that one also has to be abandoned. That this was the big dream which died different deaths. Chinese Cultural Revolution, 68, and so on and so on. I claim this is an illusion. The idea that somehow the authentic working class will awaken in some kind of direct democracy and so on. Second point, when we are anti-capitalists here, now I hope here at least we will all agree. Did you notice how today we even have, as my Indian friend Saro Idiri recently told me, wonderful expression, an overload of the critique of the horrors of capitalism. Nothing is easier than to be anti-capitalist today. In all the media you are bombarded. That corrupted banker, that, that, uh, that company which is polluting the environment, that company which is using child slave labor, and so on and so on. 
it's elementary to say what is wrong here.